to another episode of ERG Power Talk. I'm your host, Joe Santana. That clip is from a song titled People Person by Tolan Shaw. And Shaw wrote this beautiful song as an homage to his loving wife, Sarah Vahala Shaw, who he deems as a shining example of someone who's really a people person. The quality of caring for others is really important as a social glue that holds us all together as families, as neighbors, as workforce members. And studies show that caring for others in their group is one of the hallmarks of leadership in various communities across the entire animal kingdom. It's no surprise that other studies show that when human leaders care about their workers and show it, Team members respond to these feelings of warmth and connection, and they show it by embracing the leader and the organization's goals more wholeheartedly and becoming engaged and active as contributors to the company's outcome. Conversely, it's also well known that leaders who are not people caring persons are the biggest contributors to what we call the company's great resignation challenges. Now, No one feels the impact of alienation caused by managers who are not good people persons more than underrepresented people. And the financial cost of the impact of this on underrepresented communities across companies in just the United States is estimated at $34 billion in attrition, $54 billion in absenteeism, and $59 billion in productivity losses. Now, unfortunately, if you talk to a cross-section of workers today, you're going to find that managers and leaders who are people persons have become a rare breed in corporations. And perhaps that's because according to a meta-analysis of empathy test scores conducted in the United States over the past three decades, people today are just a little less empathetic than they were 30 years ago. From my conversations with my many friends from around the world, this is not happening only in America. So what's causing the significant drop in empathy and caring for other people that's found its way into the leadership ranks of our companies? And what can you do about it? Well, according to our guest today, there are several anti-humanitarian effects that he calls social framing factors that have been making it harder uh, than ever to be a, a people person today. He wrote about these in his most recent book, Why Is It So Hard? Becoming a People Person in the Post-COVID-19 Era. But before we bring in our guests, let's take a moment to revisit our mission and acknowledge our sponsors. He is the CEO of Richer Life LLC, author of several published books, some in partnership with his wife, and has enjoyed a long and rich career in management, which is the source of the wisdom that he shares as an author, speaker, and consultant. I started Richer Life LLC in 2010, and that was actually 35 years after I started my career as a young uh, electrical engineer uh, working at that time with Honeywell, believe it or not, on the mainframe computers. Okay, remember those old guys? And over the last 35 years of my corporate career, it couldn't have been better. (laughs) I couldn't have dreamed of having the kind of career, corporate career, uh, that I had. You know, I, I actually, when I reflect back on it, I was at the at the at the genesis or at the start, you know, of 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 distributed uh, computing, uh, at uh, this uh, something called a personal PC, uh, at the start of uh, of digital microprocessors. Uh, I mean, I can just just go on and on, and looking back on it, uh, it was something that I just wish everyone could have in their career, because it builds uh, the kind of depth and the kind of focus that uh, I've been able to share in the past 10 years uh, with Richer Life LLC. 
That's fantastic. Well, Earl, I'm really happy to have you here with us on ERG Power Talk today. And you gave us a little bit about your background, but recently you also published your latest book and not your first book, obviously, because you have a couple of books uh, that you've written in the past as well. And this one, as I mentioned in the opening, is titled Why It's So Hard. And you're talking about why it's so hard to be a people person. And you talk about the challenges that stand in the way of people being kinder to each other. Uh, And your focus was on America, but I think the principles you cover are really global. Can you give us a little synopsis of your thinking in this book and why you wrote it now? Sure. I, I, this particular book that my wife and I uh, was fortunate enough to get published late last year is totally outside of the genre uh, that my other 11 books are in. Okay, <laughs> and, and it was very much unintended. You know, we, uh, we drove 2,200 miles across country from our Phoenix home to our Savannah home uh, in, in uh, April 1st of, of 2020, right at the advent of uh, the coronavirus in the United States. And, uh, you know, we said, we're going to go here and we're going to shuttle in place like everyone else was being asked to do. And, of course, we're up watching the news and listening to the radio and listening to the media. And I tell you, it turned out to be a transformative experience for us. What I mean is that for us at you know, a senior state in our life to sit back and watch during a global pandemic, us Americans with so much vitriol, with so much hate, with so much partisanship, with so little unity, uh, no consensus on what was going on when, when thousands of people were dying every day. My wife and I said, wait a minute, what is this? You know, what we felt, what we saw, what we heard was something that we hadn't experienced in our lifetime. And because of that, we stood back and said, let's figure out what's going on because we have a mantra in our life that says you can not redefine a problem Okay, it is what it is. However, a problem can redefine you. And we began to feel that we were being redefined from those caring, loving people that we know we are to just listening to people that all of a sudden we feel that, geez, I don't like that person or I hate that person. What's happening? Okay. And with that, we did some research and said, why can't we be a kinder society? And what it turned out, as you mentioned, as we went through uh, hearing, reading, what other contemporary authors, what news researchers, what social activists were saying, listening to the politics, and we sifted down that there are some omnipresent influences in our lives here in America, and I'm sure at any other place, that because of how our mind works, we don't understand how invasive they are and how they are getting into creating our intuition, the basis of our daily intuition, and getting into putting beliefs and thoughts and things in our mind that we don't know how they got there, but we are spurting them out. Those are great points. You know, it's interesting that you're talking about this and you talk about some of the framing factors in your book and how important that is to understand the power of those frames and how they drive our behavior outside and inside organizations. For example, one frame that I've heard that people have is that life is something that's happening to them, whereas other people have a frame that life is something that's happening for them. So if your frame is that life is happening to you, then you look at things happening around you and you say sometimes, well, why did that happen to me? Especially if it's a negative thing, or you might feel lucky that something fell on your lap and you'll say, wow, this is great that this happened to me. But the frame is it's happening to me. Whereas if you have the frame that life is happening for you, regardless of whether what happens is something that you welcome or something that you don't, you look at it from the standpoint of Why is this here and how can I utilize it? How can this be good for me? So you ask different questions depending on the frames and you talk about how there are framing factors out there that make it so that individuals find it harder and harder 
to basically connect with other people who maybe have different frames uh, than we do. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just explore maybe an example or two in that area, and then maybe we can work our way into how that works into our organizations. Sure, and, and, and the whole focus is about humanity, okay? And, and, and we believe the, the language of humanity is a force that brings and connects people. So we looked at those influences that seem to be not connecting people, but actually bringing people apart. Uh, for example, one of the first framing factors that we spent time trying to understand is how our human mind works, okay? And for those of us who haven't really spent time thinking through or reading about or researching human psychology, it's amazing that we get it right as often as we do. Because <laughs> our mind is there to protect us, such that when we find ourselves uh, listening to, for example, all the social media and misinformation or the, the conspiracy theories, we may not think that we fall into that category, but there are things that are being said, things are being done that are being picked up and being stored in our mind in terms of how we believe we see things. Probably the nine that we selected are things that people never think about. You know, uh, you never think about that it's my mind. That, that it's made to protect me and that it's, it needs to be flushed out every now and then as far as making sure that what I'm thinking is truly in, line, truly in line with what I believe. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting as you're talking about this, as I was preparing to talk to you, I guess my mind was tuned to looking for things out there that were examples of that. And I just ran across this article that I think you'd find interesting. It was an article about a group of people who watched super ultra conservative news channel hours on every day. I mean, they just watch. This is what they consumed every day. And to your point about how that input affects the way we frame the world around us, they did an experiment where they took a number of these people and they exposed them to what was considered more centrist views for a period of time over the same number of hours. So if they were watching this very conservative news station for nine hours a day, now they were watching the centrist news station for nine hours a day. And I believe they paid them a certain amount of money to do this. But what they found was that at the end of that period of time, when they retested these people in terms of their views, the views of the people who were part of the experiment that were watching the centrist news, who weren't told that they had to change their opinion or do anything except watch this centrist type of news, there are opinions that move more to the center. Unbeknown to them, their frames had been changed somewhat. And the same thing could probably happen if you have ultra liberal to centrist or any of those different frames that people pick up. So to your point, our brain is designed to pick up these frames and we pick them up from the news. We pick them up from conversations with friends and neighbors who maybe provide an echo chamber for our belief systems and so forth. And so all of that gives us these different frames. So how do you see these elements of framing that you discuss in your book affect really diverse and complex workplace environments today? Because let's face it, all of us come into our workplace probably with different frames, depending on what we consume around us, who our friends are, our own background, the news outlets that we use, et cetera, et cetera. And then we come to this place with other people who bring all these other different frames. What are some of the things that you see in terms of the effect that has on the workplace? Well, the, the, the way we did our research, it was focused on society in general. Well, the workplace is just a slice of society. I mean, the, the, the same thoughts that, that, that go on at your, in your home uh, or with you when you walk into your office or walk into your job or, 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 or you know, whatever. The, the key, though, I think, okay, is that 
it's all about self-awareness. Uh, uh, you know, if, if I was to su suggest one book about uh, quickly getting a, a, a good uh, universal view on the mind, it would be uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Okay, I don't know if you read that or not. Okay, B because because we are lazy. <laughs> physically, mentally, your mind is lazy and it wants to work off of your intuition. And when it has nothing there and has to go to what Kahneman calls system two to really think about it, it's painful. So we would rather have nice, tidy uh, views and that's all we really want to deal with. You know, just, just think of, uh, of, of, of climate change. It's, it's too complex for most of us to get our head around. So we will take, you know, whatever view on climate, climate change that comes from someone that we listen to for some other reason. But then that become our view of climate change so we can, don't have to think about it too hard. In the workplace, what happens is that the culture that's set by senior management really can make a difference, for example, Years ago, when I went to work for Motorola, right, Bob Galvin was still the, uh, was the son of the founder of Motorola, was, was still the CEO and general manager. I walked in, and when I was processed into the company, first thing I got was uh, a, a lantern with my a badge hanging off. Every employee at Motorola wore a badge that had their name on it. Because Bob Gavin had said, I want my people to know each other. So when you're walking around the office or in the dining halls or whatever, I don't have to look at you and say, hey, what's your name? I could look at you and see your badge and say, that's Joe. Well, that type of workplace has morphed. It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so so how, now how do we treat that when, when, when people are, are working outside, uh, you know, at home, people are at different facilities around the world. So if there's a way in the culture that we can understand that it's all about creating opportunities for people to get to know each other as human beings, because it's that humanity, that human connection that can really make a difference in how people see the rest of the world. Well put. What you were just talking about now, the need for that certainly is great. There's another study that came out recently that shows that while many companies are becoming more diverse, they've also become more segregated. Isn't that interesting? So there's more diversity, but the diversity is coalescing into different little pockets as opposed to connecting across the different groups. Now, what I hear you saying is that in order to really be a good people person, it's not a matter of changing your frame to the common frame that someone else has or picking a common frame and everybody basically connecting to that one frame, but rather it's more one of having an empathy that allows you to connect with people that have different frames. And instead of living in a world where you look at everything as being either wrong or belonging to the one perfect omni frame, you look at the world as it's made up of people with different frames and all these different frames provide different valuable perspectives. And I think that in itself is at the heart of being inclusive. So as we talk about this, I really see being a truly people-centered organization as being one that truly uh, respects those different frames. So it's inclusive and probably also in terms of understanding the need for equity and what that is and why that's important for an organization that's made up of people with different backgrounds and frames to be effective. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, you know, I, I see the, the opportunities in, uh, in today's work environments to create a lot of due difference going forward, okay? Uh, the, 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 the idea of being able to uh, uh, allow people to have honest discussions, 
to explore who their uh, neighbor is uh, next door in the cubicle, to, 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 to have informal discussions uh, about not only uh, the work in their area, but the work throughout the company. Uh, I, I mean, those are the kinds of discussions that as a senior leader, it's those discussions where you begin to really formulate the company strategies. It's not in the PowerPoint meetings or whatever. I mean, all the, the senior roles that I've had, some of the best discussions I've had about what's going on, how can I help, what can I do, have come from casual discussions with people uh, that uh, you know weren't there just to, to to mimic back what you said, but who are who are willing to express their own thoughts and give their own perspectives. So being able to not only allow those discussions, but as ERG leaders uh, or DEI leaders, figuring out now how can I turn these informal discussions into something that I can share up the organization to not only improve the appreciation of the diversity of the company and of that group, but also to be able to understand the value and how that can fit into many ways the strategy in so many areas of the company. Yeah, absolutely. So Earl, let me ask you this, uh, a two-part question that follows that thread that we just started. How can leaders of corporate resource groups themselves become better people persons? What are some of the things that they can do that can enhance their skills as people persons? And the second part of that question is, how can the leaders of these groups and the members of these groups help the organization and its leadership address some of those challenges that are out there by becoming better people persons? persons themselves as leaders? Two good questions. I, I think the first one really centers around uh, creating uh, a level of self-awareness, uh, you know, uh, to, to be able to put in perspective uh, the, the value of taking the time to have some empathy and to understand things that are going on in other people's life. And, and that's easier said than done, because what takes up all of our t working time is, 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 is what's in our life, you know, but between uh, the work, between the family, between all the other things, you, 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 you never have the time. So, so, so you have to plan to sit down Saturday mornings, Sunday mornings, whatever, and think about, you know, uh, I'm going to get out of myself and look at someone else or some other thing in a totally different perspective and see if I can understand what's going on, which is what like Charlotte and I did when we were researching the book. Uh, the second thing is, 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 and my definition, a people person is simply someone who understands that the one thing we all have in common is that we are human, okay? And, and if you can say, do unto others as you had them do unto you, <laughs> is the simplest way to think about it, okay? Yeah. Now, the second question is, what can be done to, in the environment? Well, I think three things. One is, it's important uh, for ERG leaders to uh, walk the talk, that is, uh, uh, you want others to be more people-centered and people-persons, you do that. You demonstrate that stuff you, yourself. You, you be conscious of that, you know, within what you do, what you say, or what you don't do, or what you don't say. Uh, the second one, I think, is it's important to um, keep the idea of tolerance and empathy in all the conversations that you have with your cohorts uh, senior management or, or anyone. I mean, if you're in a dialogue where someone says, well, you know, uh, Jen's always late. You, you might take a moment and say, yeah, but you know, she, she has three kids and, you know, it's been rough on her uh, during 9-11. Maybe we should, you know, give her a little slack, Joe, you know? I mean, to get Joe thinking about, geez, because Joe never probably never thought about that when he made that comment, okay? Then the third thing is understanding that 
the only constant in life, I've learned this a long time ago, is change. Okay? Things will change. Things will be different. Maybe not pandemics, but things will be different. There, there, there will be circumstances. So if in your conversation with your ERG members or anywhere up the chain, okay, you want to be prepared for that change, then you should also find a way to stay connected with the company's plans and the company's strategy and the industry and what's happening in the industry, okay? Uh, uh, people, processes, and performance. That's what all business enterprises are all about, okay? And remember, the, the people side is on the cost side of the leisure, okay? So, 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 so in order to, to build the strength of your teams and to, to be able to articulate opportunities where output from these ERGs can benefit the company, you've got to have uh, a sense of where the company is going and, 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 and what those issues are. And sometimes it's not in the plan. You know, uh, COVID-19 changed many plans. <laughs> okay. So it became somehow integrated in morphing those plans, which uh, it sometimes happen. And there are other external things that happen. Great points. And I think what you're saying, as I hear it, is that you do need to become aware of what are those, the, the businesses frames, which is its goals and the different things that it's looking at the world through, and as well as being empathetic to the frames that other people have. I love the example that you gave. It kind of reminds me sometimes of when I'm driving and someone cuts me off and my frame might be, you know, wow, that was dangerous. That person could get both of us killed by doing that. And my wife who's sitting right next to me says, maybe they have an emergency that they have to get to, you know, and her frame shifts my thinking from being upset to, Wow. Yeah. Maybe they are in a bigger rush than I am. And, you know, they had to get around me because I'm an obstacle in their way and they're rushing off to see a relative in the hospital or something. So it's really interesting, the power of frames. And when you talk about it in your book, you talk about the framing factors that are causing division. But the good news is that we have the ability to change those frames or to add to those frames. And if we walk the talk of those more people-friendly centric frames, and we share that through example, and by asking questions like, well, did you think that maybe this person has three children and this pandemic has been even rougher on them? If we do that and we help other people to reframe a little bit, that just adds one more potential new frame that the person can use to see the world in a more people positive way. So I love that example. So Earl, what do we do now in this time of digitalization where everything is becoming digitalized, everything is changing very rapidly? I think that it's becoming probably more challenging in some ways, and maybe there are more opportunities in other ways to be a people person in this new world. But we know that as you mentioned before, a lot more people are working remotely than they were in the past. Also, we have workforces now which are full of people that are not necessarily all employees. In the past, a large number of people that worked in the company were employees. Today, we have 40% of the people who work in a lot of companies who are not. So with all this complexity being added in through digitalization and the world becoming more complex, what are some things that we could still do to continue to at least keep nurturing that all-important empathetic side that we need to have to build inclusive and equitable communities? Well, I think uh, from a perspective of an ERG leader or DEI leader or anyone that's leading uh, within an organization, uh, it's, it's very difficult to gain the perspective that you need to, to sort of uh, be empathetic in so many different areas, okay? So I think you have to uh, gain a sense of what are 
some themes that are common through all of the groups that I have to work with and, and, and all of the discussions that I have to have uh, throughout the line and the senior management about human resources. Well, the, the one thing that is always common is to understand that person's story. We, we all have a story and, and, and we live in our story. Okay, so if you are in a position to sh get people in the team to share their story, because in that story, you'll find ways to connect. Uh, and one, one brief example happened to me this morning. You know, I'm, I'm one of those over 60 type guys that's in the gym at four o'clock in the morning. And I was in the gym at four o'clock this morning. But before I came back home uh, to shower and change, I needed to drop by and get some adhesive for something in the shower that's falling apart. And so I went down to Lowe's Home Improvement, got my little adhesive. And at six o'clock in the morning, you can imagine what kind of employees do Lowe's have there at six in the morning, right? Uh, so I, I walk up. And here's this just cheerful young African-American man. He, he couldn't have been any more than 20, 20, I don't know, it's hard for me to tell. I'm an old guy. And he had a smile on his face. And he goes, how you doing, sir? Right? I didn't expect that at 6 o'clock in the morning. Right? And, and I turned around and said, oh, just great. I said, matter of fact, uh, uh, I just left the gym that I went to at 4 o'clock this morning, and I'm just stopping by here, and I'm getting my day started. Right? And I turned around, and he looked at me, and he said, you know, that's motivation. And when I looked at his young face, which was telling me he just saw all of his future in front of him, and then he said, I have to get here at 6, so I got up at 4, and I got here at 5.30. I'd rather be early than late. You don't hear those types of attitudes anymore. All you hear is complaints. You hear about the glass half empty, not the glass half full. If somehow each of us okay, can really sift through all of this invasion that's coming into our lives, okay? And, and, and just step away, not from understanding what's going on, but step away from being a participant. Begin to hug someone. That think of every person you run into, you know, you could have been born in that person's shoes. Absolutely. And I love the way you put that. That's very elegantly put. And one of the lessons that I get out of it is that it really goes back to that outlook that you have. I think at one point I mentioned how you can look at life as something happening to you, or you can look at life as something happening for you. You can look at every person that you meet, regardless of the frame they have as a potential adversary, or you can look at them all as a potential friend who can give you a different perspective that will add to you. So I, I just, I love the way you put that. So Earl, besides going out right now and getting your book, which by the way, folks, I got, I read, I loved it, got a lot out of it and really enjoyed the stories that Earl tells. As you can see, he speaks from his experience and from just the overall facts and figures that were in there. But again, encapsulated in those stories, it was really just an enjoyable experience that helped me to look at my own frames in a slightly different light. So I highly recommend that you go out and get the book. So besides that book, Earl, what other resources do you recommend that leaders use to prepare themselves to become better advocates and supporters of being people-centric, whether it's in their ERG or in their company or in their community? Well, I, I think it's, it's important, you know, as a leader uh, to understand that uh, the, the, your role is to lead and not manage, okay? And the, 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 the biggest difference there is that uh, you manage things, you lead people. So when you have your leadership hat on, 
uh, it's not to instruct, to tell, to direct, okay? It's to listen and understand such that you can guide the individual or the group or in, in, in the direction that you think they should go. Because it's not about, you know, right and wrong, I always say right and wrong are two of the most words, relative words in the English language. Because everyone has their, their own right and everyone has their own wrong. The idea is, but when you can break it down to talking, speaking, listening, and, 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 and doing that, not just every now and then, anytime the opportunity comes up. You know, sometime, you know, you have to just think through, you know. I, when, when someone starts describing, you know, I just got this new car. Don't talk about your new car. Let them have that moment, okay? If someone say, you know, I just got this new dress. Don't talk about your dress, okay? Sometimes you just, just have to control, you know, the output and let people have their moments. Great point. And as with regards to resources, what are some other resources in addition to your book that you recommend? Well, I certainly, as, as I mentioned, I would recommend um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, I, I, New York Times bestseller, the, uh, Nobel Prize winner. But the thing, he breaks it down so simple in terms of his view and his view is a pretty broad consensus of how the mind works and why you do the things that you do without even knowing it. I think that's, that's an excellent resource. Certainly listening to uh, uh, Power Talk and, 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 and any type of media that is gonna just give you a straight up discussion, okay, uh, about reality, uh, because that's what it's really all about. And also I think what's important is to um, get into a, uh, an organization or a group that uh, really, uh, uh, you know, takes the time to analyze issues and questions, whether it's a, a book club or whatever, because uh, if you don't do that, if you don't work your mind, if you don't force your system to, to to, to, to think and, and clear out, you know, create some, some things in your intuition that needs to be removed, it, it just won't happen. And, and you just become an older version of yourself. <clears throat> well put. Thank you for that. And Earl, how can our listeners reach you personally? Well, the, the best way to do that is uh, through our company's website. That's richerlifellc.com. R-I-C-H-E-R-L-I-F-E-L-L-C.com. And the focus is how to help shape thoughts and change lives for the better. And uh, so that's how you can find me. Fantastic. Well, Earl, thank you for your work. I think it's a wonderful labor of love that I think certainly brings joy to you and to the other people that you touch as well. And thank you again for joining us today on ERG Power Talk. Thanks for inviting me, Joe.